Good morning. But before I begin, I have to tell you that I was not in a fist fight or a plastic surgeon's office yesterday. I was or having a, an a, 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 a overdose of silicone on my lip. I was uh, at the dentist uh, most of the morning. Uh, and after the procedure, as I was leaving, the dentist warned me, she said, please do not bite your lip. I didn't bite it. I chewed it up and unwittingly, and I developed a big fat lip. However, in spite or despite of my vanity, the show must go on. So here I am with my big fat lip. I want to tell you that I come from a place of gratitude. I feel grateful, privileged, and honored to be a part of this auspicious event. When Rosalind invited me to participate, I wasn't sure what I was going to be presenting. After 81 years on the planet and more than 42 years as a psychotherapist and having authored three books, all of which were of a different subject, I, I thought to myself, what, I have so much to share. What would be meaningful uh, at this point? My latest book, I Hate the Man I Love, is not the choice that I made. I really kind of follow you, Paige, in what happened to me, my daughter. After much consideration, I wanted to leave you inspired. So I chose to talk about how I morphed my pain into purpose and passion the title of my presentation. Leon Bloy, the um, French essayist and novelist and poet has said that there are places in the heart that do not yet exist and into them suffering, enter suffering in order that they may have existence. I have about 15 minutes to share my story that took place over 15 years, more than 15 years. So let me begin at the end. I survived every parent's worst nightmare. On July 2nd, 1998, 20, over 21 years ago, my beautiful daughter, Pamela, age 34, she was a social worker and a clinical psychologist. She leaped to her death from her father's 15 story window at only 34 years of age. I don't think that Pam ever really wanted to do suicide and I don't believe that she chose suicide. In my mind, I don't think she would have ever left a legacy like that to her parents and to her siblings, brothers and sisters. I think that I truly believe it was her mental illness, bipolar disorder that was her executioner and hurled her out the window. Pam was referred to by John Bradshaw, where she worked as a wizard therapist. She spent many, many years healing the wounded souls of others while hers was being infested with a serious mental disorder. The story of her struggle is really too long to share in the time that I have allotted. So I'll have to share what I hope will be your takeaway from my story, how I morph my pain into passion and purpose. Grief has many stages. I spent years traveling through each stage with the exception of bargaining. There was no need to bargain. There was nothing left to bargain. She was dead. Grievers are nocturnal, sleepless nights are common. I was compelled to go to my computer each night and pour my heart out to my companion, my desktop. I wrote endlessly, somehow managing to go to work each day, which I still can't believe I did. Also doing the exact same thing that my daughter did, healing the souls of my clients while, my, while mine was bleeding. Even as I write and speak, even as I speak about this now, I'm still feeling some of the pain and sorrow of the loss of my daughter, my eldest daughter. I have five children. She was my first. I wrote each night as if a muse had control over my body and mind. 
it was um, it was not possible for me not to write. I couldn't sleep. It was seven years later that I finally stopped writing. I realized that I had something that might be helpful to other people who were going through or had gone through the kind of loss, the kind of grief that I had. So I decided that I would take my journaling from those seven years and transform it into a book. And I called it, Why Did She Jump? My Daughter's Battle with Bipolar Disorder. It was not my last book. It was the book before this. It was released in 2014. And I myself became a grief counselor out of that. And in addition, I also sought professional help. I saw a grief counselor and later soon became certified as a grief counselor myself. I spent several weeks in a group that was for survivors. And it seemed more like a victim's group than a survivor group. Parents had been there for years, sometimes 20 years, still mourning the loss of their children, their deceased children. I realized very soon that I didn't want to do that, that that was not going to be me. Uh, after her death, the initial shock, the overwhelming grief, and the cascade of emotions, I realized that I had choices. I could become a victim of this nightmare. I could live my life as a survivor in quiet desperation, forever immersed in the events of loss. But that's not what I chose. I decided to morph my pain into purpose and passion and become kind of like the phoenix not unlike that mythological bird that rises from the ashes and becomes more empowered. As a mother of four surviving children, a grandmother of six and a psychotherapist of more than 42 years, I chose the latter and found a way to give meaning to my daughter's life and death. Embracing the collateral beauty, I was able to find acceptance and peace. Ultimately, by helping others, I continue to help myself. It is a story of tragedy and of heartbreak, but it is also a story of hope, courage, and healing. We either gain strength from adversity or we become victims. The choice is ours. There has really been very little, if any, real improvement in our mental health system, at least in the United States, since my daughter died, since her death. Baker acting is really not a cure at all. If anything, it's worse than doing nothing sometimes. People come out feeling worse than they did when they came in. We need long-term treatment. Long-term treatment centers with qualified professionals, not 24 to 72 hours for a patient to get stabilized and then be, then be discharged to go back to their homes, really not solving anything. And their suffering continues. Unless you are very rich or very poor, help for mental illness, it's just not available. Indigent don't really get help, but they have more opportunity than the middle class. It was a very expensive investment to try to save my daughter's life, to try to help her. Bipolar disorder takes years to get a differential diagnosis, mainly because it has so much comorbidity and it mimics so many other diseases. And like you said, Paige, there is so many people that die of suicide in this country only because they can't get the help required that's needed. The homeless are not really lazy people. They're sick, most, most of them depressed or with mental illnesses and many with bipolar disorder. The system just didn't work. It just failed us when we needed it the most. 
So Pamela was an extraordinary young woman. I didn't know for years that she had anything wrong with her. Bipolar doesn't really show up until in the early 20s. But she did have some red flags in her high school years, in her teenage years. But as a mother, it was hard to be objective. You didn't want to think that your daughter was going to be suicidal or have a mental disorder. It's hard to accept that reality. And I didn't really notice that she had her first break when she was 24 years old. She was in California working for the John Bradshaw Center. And as I said, healing the souls of these one very wounded adult children of dysfunctional families while her soul was falling apart, being infested by a horrible disease that took 10 years to diagnose bipolar disorder one, which is different. There's a difference between bipolar disorder one and bipolar disorder two. And now it's on the spectrum. Now there's going to be bipolar three and four. Bipolar one is probably the most serious because she was in a delusional state. And she thought that the devil was going to take her soul, no matter what we tried to do. When you have a belief system that's installed like that, it's impossible to effectuate any positive change and to make her feel that her belief system was really a delusion. And as a psychologist, a clinical psychologist and a social worker, I would try to talk to her and say to her, Pammy, if you had a patient in your office that told you that the devil was going to take her soul, what would be your first response? Because there were lucid moments. It's not, it, it mimics schizophrenia and other mental disorders, but it, it has, a, a, it's sort of like she can go in and out of lucidity. And her response was, oh, I would think that they were psychotic or they were paranoid. They were having some kind of a psychotic break. So she understood it on some level, but she couldn't shake it. She just couldn't. And I didn't know that she was going to commit suicide. I spoke to her only two days before, and I was in Wisconsin while she was in Florida. She was under the care of a psychologist and a psychiatrist. And I asked her the question that I never wanted to ask her, but I just felt compelled because I was away. I was far away, and I wasn't really with where I could be reached easily. So I said, Pammy, I'm going to ask you a question that's really hard for me to ask. Have you ever thought of killing yourself of suicide? She responded with such reassurance and such conviction and said to me, mom, I would never consider doing anything like that. I would never leave a legacy like that to you and daddy and my siblings. Somehow I had a mother's feeling when I hung up. She gave me three reasons. Those were two. The other one was that she said, I'm Jewish and we're not allowed to kill ourselves. But I called her psychiatrist after I hung up and I said to her, listen, I'm very worried about my daughter. I'm up in Wisconsin. I'm on my way down to North Carolina tomorrow. I know she has an appointment with you on Thursday. And this was Tuesday. I said, I'm worried about her. Would you please consider putting her in a hospital? And of course her response was that she is not qualified. Her insurance would not cover it. She was on an HMO, which was like having nothing. So I said, look, her father and I will take care of it. Just put her in so for safety, because I think that she might be suicidal. Her psychiatrist, her name was Carol. She said, no, no, she's not suicidal. She's psychotic, but she's not suicidal. So I said, well, what if she has a delusional uh, a, a delusional voice or a delusional system that says, to jump out of a window or something. And she said, okay, listen, this is what I'll do. I'll assure you, I will see her Thursday, which would have been two days later, and I will hospitalize her and check her out. Pammy never made it to the psychiatrist. She died the next, she died the next morning. And I didn't find out about it until about midnight that night. I was traveling from Wisconsin to North Carolina. So I am the survivor of every parent's worst nightmare. So now my mission is to destigmatize and eliminate the shame from mental illness and to effectuate progressive change 
in our substandard mental health system so that others don't fall through the cracks as my daughter Pam did. And this will be my legacy. Thank you so much.